Good morning. This is John Everblessed here. I'm going to share the screen here. Start my camera. My camera is on. Let me turn that to speaker view. But we have, that's not working. Speaker view. Yeah, let's start the share here. Okay, before we get started, I'm going to pray for God's presence here. Lord Father, we thank you for these opportunities, for you teaching us and giving these puzzle pieces amongst us all that we can share. We ask for your blessing in that, that it continues, and that the Holy Spirit be with us here today to rightly interpret uh, what is said, what we learn, whatever you put into our heads, sir. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, thank you for attending. This is part three of Eden, God's magnificent outdoor automatic healthcare system. Part three is entitled Treating Cancer Eden's Way. Now, this presentation is not a medical presentation, it's simply a collection and comparison of successful cancer recovery stories using different natural methods evaluated from an Eden perspective. It's really about God's natural law healthcare system and what he has been trying to tell us for generations, that his Eden healthcare system is simple, easy, free, powerful, harmless, and automatic. His healthcare system is embedded in nature. <clears throat> it both prevents and reverses disease. Therefore, we can expect that the most successful treatments of cancer will also include some kind of Eden experience. So what would a cancer healing Eden lifestyle look like, ideally? Well, let's look back and review Adam and Eve's healing lifestyle. Here they are. Right. Live, work, and sleep outdoors. Full body sunlight and air exposure. Tend the garden, eat organic plant foods exclusively from that garden. Pure water, work when it's light, sleep when it's dark. Walk barefooted, live low stress, live chemical free. No electricity, no EMFs or Wi-Fi in the Garden of Eden. We are to work with nature, not against it. Rest on the Sabbath, walk with God daily develop a trusting relationship with him. Marry someone nice and don't talk to snakes. Don't, in other words, don't parlay with sin. So a natural cancer treatment would necessarily fit somewhere within these hygienic principles, depending on the person and the disease. The more of these principles adopted, the more likely cancer would be prevented and or reversed. We are told that life in the open air is good for body and mind. It is God's medicine for the restoration of health. Pure air, good water, sunshine, the beautiful surroundings of nature. These, these are his means for restoring the sick to health in natural ways. To the sick, it is worth more than silver or gold to lie in the sunshine or the shade of the trees. Seriously? I mean, that's pretty clear. Life in the open air is God's medicine for the restoration of health. And there are many, many such statements as these from the same author. Healing is to be found outdoors in nature. But what about that tree thing? Why would lying under trees be worth more than silver or even gold? Really? I'm thinking she's trying to tell us something very important. Well, since we know that all of nature was designed to keep Adam and Eve healthy, effortlessly, mostly, and that different parts of nature had different jobs in keeping Adam and Eve healthy, then we must expect that trees also offer something that can prevent and reverse disease, right? Have we ever been given such counsel? Well, here's something. This is from Councils on Health from Ellen White. 
She says, there are life-giving properties in the balsam of the pine, in the fragrance of the cedar and the fir. And there are other trees that are health-promoting. Let no such trees be ruthlessly cut down. Cherish them where they are abundant and plant more where there are but few. Have we ever taken that seriously before? I mean, wow. Have we ever implemented this into any of our lifestyle health programs deliberately? What if God placed those life-giving healing properties into the trees to specifically treat things like cancer? I mean, from the beginning, God has made provisions for the terrible emergencies of disease. So it would be no surprise were we to find scientific evidence of such a thing, right? And here it is, and it is spectacular. The following excerpts are from the book, The Healing Code of Nature by Clemens G. Arve, biologist. He was not an Adventist. I don't think he was even a Christian. Uh, by the way, about this author, this young scientist also died a mysterious death, like so many other doctors and scientists who spoke publicly against pharmacaea and the jabs. He had influence. It's the doctors and scientists who had real influence that were being murdered and still are. There's a very long list. Uh, this is what he says, and it gets better as we go. So hold on. International studies show a strong link between the presence of trees and human health. Renowned scientific journals such as Science and Nature have already published such evidence. Even the view from the hospital window of a tree activates the self-healing powers of patients after operations. Isn't that interesting? Like a man is stimulated just by the view of a beautiful woman. The view of a beautiful tree or a forest even also <laughs> creates a reaction within us. This time it's for healing. All right, he continues. The danger of suffering from modern civilization diseases decreases the increasing number of trees around the center of a person's life. Oh, According to a Canadian study, the health effect of 10 additional trees around the center of life of a Toronto city dwellers would correspond to a seven-year makeover. Really? In order, order to fathom these immensely positive effects on humans, scientists all over the world set out in search of explanations. And this gets better, I told you, as it goes. Among other things, it turned out that trees emit chemical words during plant communication, which are molecular coolness from the substance group of terpenes, which carry meanings in the world of plants, similar to the vocabulary of human language. Our immune system, which according to recent findings is a communicative sensory system, reacts to these tree terpenes with a significant increase in defenses and mechanisms protecting against cancer in our bodies. There it is, but there's more. The fact that these effects are actually due to tree terpenes was often confirmed by scientists in accompanying laboratory experiments. International cancer researchers who otherwise have nothing to do with trees independently found in laboratory experiments that terpenes from trees act against what? Tumor cells, cancer tumor cells. These patients, these scientists, even underlined the pharmaceutical potential of plant terpenes as highly concentrated chemotherapy drugs in the future treatment of cancer. Yeah, don't count on that. Our immune system, this is still a quote from this scientist, our immune system is not strengthened by substances from trees, but is weakened by the separation from these substances in modern life. Now, that is a proper take on things. He says, stays in nature do not lead to more immune cells, 
but bring their number and activity back to a natural level. That sounds like the truth, doesn't it? The advance of civilization diseases is caused not only by environmental toxins that are added, but also by the separation from natural products of nature as grown. Yes, this is why God intended that Adam and Eve live, work, and sleep outdoors. And it's why he intends that we heal outdoors. Trees in the forest protect their own terpenes from direct sunlight and thus prevent the substances that are healthy for us from being destroyed by ultraviolet radiation. They even retain their own gaseous plant substances so that they cannot escape. They remain most concentrated, these terpenes, at exactly the height at which our nose is located. Do the trees mean well for us? This is a scientist asking this, a non-Christian scientist. The fact that nature offers healing substances against almost every disease leads some of us to the feeling that the natural remedies were formed by plants for us. He's almost getting it, isn't he? And of course, that's true. Natural remedies were formed by plants for us. And God made that happen. A loving, merciful, all-knowing God has had this whole thing figured out from the beginning. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God created a healthcare system for us that is equally fearfully and wonderfully made. We need to get back to it. So how long does all this effect last? Well, here's an excerpt from a research paper that gives us the answer to that question. And I'm just going to go directly to it. This effect lasted for more than 30 days after those trips into, into nature's, into the forest, suggesting that, a visiting, that visiting a forest park once a month would enable individuals to maintain a higher level of natural killer cells activities. <laughs> God is so good. He is so amazing. And it's high time we start listening to him on this and this whole outdoor thing. So I feel as though we should ask the question here, is this, this tree thing, another long lost Eden healing principle? Folks, I believe it is strongly. Grounding or earthing was a lost Eden healing healing principle as well. And when it was recently rediscovered, magnificent healing stories have been flooding in from scientific papers and from testimonies of people who have done it, who have walked barefooted on the ground. So for those of us that are wanting a health ministry to treat patients, to start lifestyle centers and sanitariums, what if we intentionally started treating cancer in places where these trees are in abundance, where sunlight and fresh air and beauty of nature are in abundance. Just think of the flood of magnificent healing stories that could be generated. This is a beautiful example of God's serene, gentle, peaceful, outdoor automatic healthcare system. This is what true healing <laughs> looks like. Really, I got to say it again. This is what true healing looks like. I suspect that this is yet another counter agent that God is directing us to in these end times to meet this ongoing end time genocidal culling of mankind by the merchants of pharmacia and the governments of this world. Well, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? It is a beautiful truth that God has made our healthcare so incredibly simple and automatic. He has embedded our healthcare into nature. Just working in the garden, our health is improving. Eden contained God's built-in health statutes. His natural law demonstrated, put into practice, and showcased for us all. Clearly, God's commandments and statutes are not grievous. They are beautiful and peaceful 
and serene. And God tells us what we can expect if we keep his statutes. Here's his promise about that. He says, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, mm -hmm. and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. This, this is the underlying foundation of all health and healing and this entire presentation. Mm -hmm. Cancer would be it cancer or any other disease. If this quote is all that you take away from this presentation, I will be satisfied. There is more, but please remember this one. And I'm going to present it again at the very end. This is to become our new way to approach health and healing in these end times. Healthcare is not about hospitals or doctors or medical insurance or pharmaceuticals or gadgetries or tall buildings. It has nothing to do with mortal man's medical theories. It is this that we do that which is right in God's sight, that we keep his statutes and trust the provisions that he has specified for our health and healing, which he has promised, promised to bless as we use them. And he promised that in writing. It's about simple obedience to God, complete surrender to his will. Let me give you an example from my own experience. I was sick for a year and a half, and I didn't know why. And I kept getting more and more serious symptoms, a big list. I thought I was going to die. One of those symptoms was a long-term continuous sharp pain in both in my back on both sides. My doctor told me that that was adrenal fatigue from constant fear and anxiety for a year and a half from those mysterious health conditions. Things had gotten so bad that my wife and I knelt down to pray together. Now, we had done this many times before, but this time, this time I completely surrendered myself to God unto death. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The results be what they may. I did not want to do this. I didn't feel anything but fear and sinfulness either before or after that prayer. No particular sense of peace or joy or anything. Yet when I got up from my prayer, I realized that the long-term adrenal pain had been healed. Healed. No fanfare, just gone. It was the surrender to God unto death that moved the hand of the Lord to heal. This is the foundation of healing. He says, I am the Lord that healeth thee. And just so you know, I was already eating exceedingly healthfully according to natural law. But that alone did not trigger the miraculous healing from God for me. One way or the other, true healing is a spiritual matter. It has always involved God. According to the Song of Solomon 1612, for it was neither herb nor mollifying plaster that restored them to health, but thy word, O Lord, which healeth all things. This new change of emphasis is exceedingly important in the light of the next quote. This is Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. God gave us health principles which, if they had been followed, might have made us the healthiest people in the world, a power wherever we are, and an example to the world. There will come a time when these diseases will come with such power and intensity that they will strike down everybody that has not yielded to God. That time has come, and you all know that time has come. There is no way we're going to survive the many weapons 
formed against us in these last days unless we are fully yielded to God and his specified healing agents, which he has promised to bless. Now, Dr. Kellogg was no saint, and he was no prophet, and he had his problems. But this, this statement, these quotes, these sound like the truth, don't they? These statutes and health principles of Eden are God's counter agents to the weapons formed against us in these end times. They both prevent and reverse disease and carry God's blessings. God has always known what would be coming for us in this age, and he has made provisions for the terrible emergencies. And those provisions, well, they're going to be found in nature's outdoors, aren't they? If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight. Yes, we are told that we are to do that which is right in his sight. Yet there are a lot of, lot of conflicting ideas of what is right in his sight as far as treating cancer naturally. We all, of course, know it's not in the realm of pharmacia. Of course not. But, now, but how do we know if, cancer if a particular cancer regime is right in the sight of God? Well, here's some very basic, simple, common sense tests. One, has God specified it? Number two, is it in harmony with natural law and Eden health principles? Number three, does it preserve the natural order of things? Because we know that when we start messing with the natural order of things, awful things begin to happen. If not immediately, in the long term, they certainly will. All right, number four, is it non-toxic? Number five, is it simple? Number six, is it free or inexpensive? Like fresh air. Does the regime use God's healing agents as its primary therapy? Okay, in the context of these tests, we are now going to examine different groups or people who have reversed their cancers without pharmaceuticals using different natural regimes, or at least claim to be natural regimes. The stories that I tell, or I'm about to tell, are the stories that have been placed in my path. I did not go looking for these. They were already placed in my path. And I believe God had been leading. I don't address surgery here for cancer. I don't address emergency care here for cancer. I'm just addressing God's general healing principles. All right, we're going to see which of these natural cancer regimes pass one or more or all of these tests. Which ones do that which is right in God's sight? Maybe we can find some common denominators, perhaps, amongst them that might show us the distilled essence of preventing and treating cancer. Let me give you a hint. It does. We're going to find out. So we're going to start with the most famous of all natural cancer recovery regimes. You probably already, the name probably already popped in your head. The Gerson Therapy. Apparently considered the gold standard of alternative natural cancer treatments. So what did Dr. Gerson do? This is his book. Dr. Gerson treated mostly advanced, highly advanced, well, far advanced cancer patients. He used no traditional pharmacia, which was good. It was mostly food, juicing, and coffee enemas. It worked well enough, and he broadcast it so thoroughly that the medical fraternities had him murdered. They murdered him with poison. It was arsenic. So he had, and he knew it. So he had to be doing something right. He cured hundreds of cases of cancer, tuberculosis, migraines, arthritis, etc. Took him a while, though. This section is based on this book, and I'm going to spend a, uh, more time on him than others because his was so elaborate. The others will go very much faster. All right, let's take a look at his regime. 
<laughs> All right. To my surprise, as I started really looking into it, the Gerson therapy was not at all, at all, what I thought it was. It is and was overwhelmingly excessive and complicated. There are numberless restrictions, exceptions, and instructions of if this, then that. It was a giant labyrinth that was ever changing. Nothing was simple or pure. This little chart appears to be simple, but it was not, believe me. And more surprises await us. This green section are those um, agencies which were specified by God. The yellow, it depends on how you look at it, but the red are definitely not specified by God. Um, and I mark which ones um, Dr. Gerson used. And I'll go through these as uh, right now. Diet. The WPBF means whole plant-based foods. Uh, he advocated fruits, vegetables, potatoes, some milk products, grains, but no berries, no nuts, no pineapples, no avocados or cucumbers, no solid meat. It is still much more complicated than this. I'm, I'm simplifying it. But the milk products was the very first surprise. That immediately disqualifies the Gerson therapy for being called a whole plant-based diet or, or vegan. And there's more. There will be more perversions like this as we continue. Sunlight. This is the only thing he said about sunlight. Exposure to sunlight should be minimized. Really? Yet God placed Adam and Eve in a garden in the sunlight all day, every day, naked to show just how good it is and how much we need. We need all that we can get. <sighs> exercise. A cancer patient needs lots of rest. Do not try to do much exercise or work in the early stages of the program. Now, he had very, very, very end-stage cancer patients. That may be good, maybe not good. I've got another patient that we talk about here who did exercise in end-stage. So let's go on to the next. Juicing. That's what he was most known for, right? This is what he advocated. A glass of fresh juice, freshly squeezed juice that hour, every hour for 13 consecutive hours daily for two years. Because that's usually how long it took him to cure a patient. Three, it included three glasses of fresh calf liver juice. Yes, folks, that is what it says. Calf liver juice. Four glasses of green vegetable juice, six glasses of fruit juice. Then, thin, excuse me, thin filtered gruel, like oatmeal, was added to the juices at first because of patient sensitivity to so much juices. Drinking water was forbidden so that room would be available for all the juices and soup going into the stomach. This is still a quote. I've got references for all of these. They're listed here. Because of the extensive juicing of vegetables, a follower of the Gerson eating plan takes in between 17 to 20 pounds of plant foods each day. <laughs> okay, man. The now common practice of juicing seems to be traced mostly back to Dr. Gerson. And you will note that those three glasses of calf liver juice are obscene and not in any way in harmony with God's natural law or whole plant-based diet or Eden principles. Even if his juicing was made up of 100% plants, it would still not be whole plant-based foods. And how on earth is 20 pounds of produce ever, every day considered sustainable? affordable or reasonable or practical and the time it takes to juice all these things it is clearly excessive and grievous grievous but god's health statutes are not grievous which means so far that the gerson therapy is not built on eden or biblical principles it was a series of experiments just so you know None of the other cancer regimes are grievous, yet they work too. Interesting, okay? 
supplements. 50 milligrams, one tablet, six times a day. That is a lot of niacin. Then uh, he used the potassium compounds, linseed oil. He discovered that hormones and some vitamins, E, A, D, et cetera, he says, and calcium phosphates compositions and keratin had a carcinogenic effect. Really? No calcium, no magnesium, no other minerals because they caused cancer to regrow in his patients. Let's reword this. Basically, Gerson found that many vitamins and mineral supplements caused the cancer to regrow in his patients. Now, the next slide from Forks Over Knives seems to verify this. Quote, isolated nutrients like juicing and um, supplements will never have the same beneficial effect as healthy whole foods. As has been shown time and time again in repeated failed trials of vitamins, this is covered in greater detail in the China study and in Whole, the movie Whole. In addition, multivitamins are not necessarily benign. There is evidence in some studies that risk of certain cancers in some patient groups is increased with supplemental use. In addition, there may be a higher risk of kidney stones and heart attacks in those who use calcium supplements. Vitamin and mineral supplements can be a significant cause of poisoning in children and birth defects and liver damage have been associated with excess vitamin ingestion. Why? Because they mess with the natural order of things. I want you to remember that. Mess with the natural order of things and we hurt ourselves. Evidence has existed for quite some time that the regular use of concentrated supplements can cause harm by messing with the natural order of things. And soon, folks, we won't even have access to supplements and concentrates anyway. And if that's not enough for you, it's become clear all over the internet that the pharmaceutical companies are buying up the vitamin and mineral supplement companies. You know what that means. It means that they, the merchants of pharmacaea, will have direct access to these things and can inject into them whatever hidden payload, payloads they want, like they did with vaccines. Supplements are now becoming the domain of pharmacaea. So, one way or the other, folks, we are going to need to start weaning ourselves off of them. I prefer cold turkey at this time. That's what's needed at this time. All right, medications. This is taken mostly from the pages 236, 237, and 245 of A Cancer Therapy. This is about the Gerson therapy. Basically, lubile capsules are dried powdered bile from young animals. Three cc's of fresh crude calf liver extract combined with B12 daily injections. Pancreatin, digestive enzymes from pegs, three tablets, four times a day. Armor thyroid hormone made from animal thyroid glands, mostly from pigs. And iodine, potassium iodine in water, three drops, six times a day. There is nothing vegan about Gerson's program. Some of it is quite defiling. Enemas, coffee, castor oil. These are quotes. Frequent enemas, day and night. On average, we give coffee enemas every four hours, day and night. And even more frequently against severe pain, nausea, general nervous tensions, and depression. Enemas also help against spasms, precordial pain, and difficulties resulting from the sudden withdrawal of all intoxicating sedation. On the average, every day, we give two tablespoons of castor oil by mouth, followed by a cup of black coffee, and five hours later, a castor oil enema, in addition to the coffee enemas without interrupting their frequency. Difficult as this may be to believe, experience has proved that frequent enemas completely eliminate the need for sedation. Some patients take enemas every two hours, or even more frequently during the first days of the treatment. 
Yes, that was a heavy sigh. Surely you and I, these listeners here, all understand that God has provided a better way than all of this, that we'll do the same thing, but much better without harm, without excess, without exhausting the patients. The very first health vision given to Ellen White was in 1888. It was a simple warning against three things only, tea, tobacco, and coffee. God said that we should not use coffee, yet so many ignored this counsel and say, well, God's counsel doesn't apply if we stick it up our bum. Seriously? This is entirely mortal man's medical theories. But some say, but it works. To which I would respond, God has provided a better way. And that's why we are all sharing our puzzle pieces that God has given us. We're relearning what has been lost. We are to trust his specified provisions. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are ways of death. Stuffed. Constant eating and drinking. Eat and drink as much as you can, even during the night when awake. <laughs> oh, the madness of this. This clearly contradicts natural law health principles. That, that would be intemperance and the definition of gluttony. It is a massive overfeeding. 13 glasses of juices and meat juices and whatever else a patient can jam into his mouth. This isn't based on biblical principles at all. It's based entirely on mortal man's medical theories alone, guesses. Nature's laws are simple. Eden demonstrated that our health care is easy and automatic and simple and temperate. The road to health does not require excess, nor does it require such a complicated labyrinthine maze. The Gerson therapy does not fit Eden's health principles. So how is it then that patients got better with this atrocious program? It's a reasonable question. We must acknowledge that it did work, but just because something in this grievous system worked doesn't mean that it was all necessary. God told Captain Naaman in the Bible to dip himself in the Jordan River seven times to cure his leprosy. Would it, would it have improved his healing to dip 21 times? God specified what it would take for him to restore his health, just as he has specified what it would take for us to restore our health. There were some things that fit natural law and Eden principles but mostly things that were eliminated from the diet that caused the healing. Most dairy products, baking sodas, salt, oils, fats, refined sugar, refined flour, canned foods, preserves, pickles, to tobacco, sharp spices, tea, chocolate, alcohol, cr cream, ice cream, cake, and solid meat. These were all eliminated. It was very likely the elimination of these sorts of things that caused the healing in the Gerson therapy. So I suspect all those other things only slowed the healing. The elimination of solid meat alone may have reversed the cancers. The following quote from Ellen White is why I say that. This was described, well, let's just read it. Cancer Tumors and all inflammatory diseases are largely caused by meat eating. From the light which God has given me, the prevalence of cancers and tumors is due to gross living on dead flesh. And this revelation fits Eden principles. Man was assigned to care for the animals, but we messed with the natural order of things when we started killing and eating them. It's a horror story. And those that continue to eat meat are paying the price. All right, that's it for the Gerson therapy. Moving on to Dr. McDougall. This is very short. 
We're all familiar with Dr. McDougall, probably. Dr. McDougall offers a 12-day online education program. It features a low-fat, starch-based vegan diet, truly vegan. The diet rejects all animal products, as well as cooking oils, processed foods, refined sugar, and supplements, and salt. He does not advocate juicing. Exercise is advocated as is sunlight, but very briefly. Mostly, it was food. In the video Forks Over Knives, in the context of this program, Dr. McDougall talks about a patient who reversed her cancer. And then he says about other patients he was dealing with, other women get over breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. There are people who have had metastatic prostate cancer all over their body who have gone through what we call spontaneous remission. In other words, they've been cured. His program was all about the food. An Eden diet. It was so simple. All right. The China study, you've heard this. The China study described a monumental survey of diet and death rates from cancer in more than 2,400 Chinese counties. It was the largest and most comprehensive study ever undertaken of the relationship between diet and the risk of developing disease, including cancer, especially cancer. They found nearly 9,000 statistically significant correlations between diet and disease. One message was through them all, quote, plant-based diet is always associated with lower mortality of certain cancers, stroke and heart disease. Whole plant-based diets were beneficial to health while animal-based foods were not, period. That was it, it was so simple. They found that cancer, as well as many other diseases, was primarily associated with meat eating all over China. Turning cancer on and off. The author of the China study took a group of rats, injected them with increasing doses of a known carcinogen, aflatoxin. He then switched their diets back and forth between 5% and 20% casein, the main protein in dairy products, doing so in three week intervals. Intervals, the results were astonishing. Whenever the rats were fed 20% protein, early liver tumor growth exploded. But when the same rats were given 5% protein, 5% of the total calorie intake, tumor growth actually went down, reversed. Dr. Campbell said this was yet another result demonstrating that a low protein diet could override the cancer causing effects of a, of a very powerful carcinogen, aflatoxin. Oh, and then here it gets more interesting. He, sa he asked the question, is it possible that chemical carcinogens in general do not cause cancer unless the nutritional conditions are right. Is it possible that for much of our lives, we are being exposed to a small amount of cancer-causing chemicals, but cancer does not occur unless we consume foods that promote and nurture tumor development? Can we control cancer nutrition? Cancer through nutrition, he asks. We're gonna find a pattern later on, and I'm thinking he's correct. He says, plant protein tested in the same way, plant protein tested in the same way did not produce cancer growth, even at the higher levels of intake. Isn't that fascinating? All right, here are just a few more of their research conclusions from the China study. Number one, synthetic chemicals in the environment and in your food, as problematic as they may be, are not the main cause of cancer. They discovered that. Number two, the genes that you inherit from your parents are not the most important factors in determining whether you fall prey to any of the 10 leading causes of death, including cancer. Number three, obsessively controlling your intake of any one nutrient, such as carbohydrates, fat, cholesterol, or omega-3 fats, etc., will not result in long-term health. Number four conclusion, vitamins and nutrient supplements do not give you long protection against disease. 
Conclusion number five, drugs and surgery do not cure the diseases that kill most Americans. And number six, your doctor probably does not know what you need to do to be the healthiest you can be. Okay, all right. In other words, the author of the China study is saying that these six things are now seen in their true position in the light of the research of the China study. He's saying that the real issue is meat eating, not chemicals, not genetics. He's saying that cancer is not cured by a silver bullet nutrient or supplements or drugs like chemo and radiation or even surgery, but simply a plant-based diet. And he's saying that you can expect that your doctor will likely disagree. Number five. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, there's a section here I really want to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about it posted online. So I'll talk about it in comments when it's not being filmed, but it's very important. I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube. All right, we go on. Remember this statement? Yeah, let's skip this. We're kind of running low on time. African tribes. This African tribe, this is, this is long ago stories. This African tribe lived in the sunlight all day, every day, naked, their entire lives. Would you expect them to have fabulous vitality or be filled with cancer? One of these things is true. All right, here's the story. Some of the, un this is from the Sanitarium News uh, Bulletin, November 1, 1929. Some of the unclothed tribes of Central Africa who live on a diet similar to that of a gorilla, basically vegetarian, almost vegan, and with their naked bodies bathed in the glowing rays of a tropical sun are free from parasitic diseases and are possessed of a resistance so high that cancer, one of the scourges of all civilized lands, is unknown and such a thing as appendicitis has, was never heard of. Yeah, they bathe their naked bodies in the glowing rays of the tropical sun. Their dark skins have a luster and silken feel that no cosmetic could improve. And, in the, and the tide of life, oh my, runs so high in their lithe bodies that there is no end to their endurances. Remember those stories of outdoor living? Same thing. Endurance, endurance, endurance. The men run, and sunlight and fresh air does that. The men run with government dispatches 60 miles a day, day after day for hundreds of miles. Now, I told you that story to tell you this one. Another African tribe also lived and worked in the sunlight all day, every day, naked, all their lives, without cancer. But this tribe made one tiny, tiny, seemingly insignificant change in the name of fashion, which resulted in cancer. Here's the story. This is Dr. John Ott speaking. He says, at a dinner given prior to one of my lectures, I sat next to the daughter of the late Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Our conversation dwelt mostly on her experiences as assistant to her father at Lambering on the west coast of Africa. I asked her about the rate of cancer of the people in that area, and she replied that when her father had first started the hospital, they found no cancer at all. But that now, it was a problem. So I asked if the people living there had started installing glass windows and electric light in their otherwise simple surroundings, and she said they had not. But then I, I have jokingly asked her if any of these natives wore sunglasses. She looked at me startled and then told me that the natives paddling their dugout canoes up and down the river in front of the hospital often wore no more than a loincloth and sunglasses. And indeed, some wore only the sunglasses. She further explained that sunglasses represented have come to be represented as a status symbol of civilization and education and had a higher bartering value than beads and other such trinkets. 
God gave sunlight a vital role to play through the eyes, not just through the skin. A simple pair of sunglasses filtered and distorted natural sunlight to the eyes long enough to cause cancer. Again, we cannot mess with Eden's natural order of things and still expect health and healing. Sunglasses are yet another thing that man's medical science got wrong, and they were billed as protective. And of course, the opposite was the truth. Eden was truly to be our model for health and healing. We need to study it. All right, some of Dr. John Ott's cancer stories. Skin cancer cleared by light. This is Ott speaking. One of my friends had been troubled with skin cancer and on several occasions had undergone minor surgery. He was again having considerable difficulty and his physician had recommended further surgery. I've seen those surgeries. They, they totally, oh, they just dig into the flesh, big holes, and it, it just maims them or distorts their arms, whatever, wherever it's at. Anyway. However, on his own initiative, he decided to try the same UV ocular therapy that he was giving his wife for her eye condition. Immediately, his skin cancers began to disappear. And within a matter of four or five months, his skin appeared perfectly normal without surgery or other treatment. Now, here's the slide that contains the ocular therapy that Dr. Ott was talking about. It's very simple. Spend as much time as possible outdoors. Full exposure as much as possible. Number two, avoid wearing any eyewear and looking through glass. Number three, avoid artificial light sources. And today that means in, that includes TV and computer screens, etc. Simple, automatic, free. Lung cancer and sunglasses. Lung cancer too? All right. This is John Ott again. A personal friend of mine told me of an acquaintance of his, a man in his early 70s who had just been diagnosed having terminal lung cancer. This man lived in the Southwest and wore sunglasses most of the time. My friend sent him a copy of My Ivory Cellar, that's his book, and a set of the instruction sheets that had been given to the 15 patients in New York City for living out of doors as much as possible and avoiding artificial light. The elderly lung patient agreed to follow the instructions. The tumor completely disappeared. And he lived for approximately eight years before dying of a heart complication from something else, lifestyle. Prostate cancer versus pink eyeglasses. Pink, by the way, is a real thing. I had to take out that whole section because it's just too long. Dr. John Ott is speaking. He says an elderly acquaintance had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and surgery had been recommended. I found that he had for many years been wearing eyeglasses with a light pink tint. And I was able to persuade him to stop wearing these and get some new full spectrum clear UV transmitting spectacles. I advised him to cut down as much as possible on watching TV and to spend more time outdoors or at least an open screened porch. He has now gone for three years without surgery and the problem has apparently disappeared. There are several other stories available concerning pink and light in our health. Just like I say, not enough time to present them. Now, this is a, about a two-minute clip. This is what it's going to say, just in case that clip doesn't work. Leukemia outbreak in a school traced back to green curtains and warm pink fluorescent lighting. Leukemia is a blood cancer. This story is another example of cancer developing because the light entering through the eyes has been filtered and distorted. Here's the two-minute clip. Let's pray this works. Here's the St. John Brebeuf School in Niles, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. In 1963, the Communicable Disease Center of the U.S. Public Health Service in Atlanta reported an unusually high rate of leukemia with the children attending this school. 
the highest rate of any school in the country, five times the national average. Many of the national cancer agencies, both public and private, have investigated this situation, but no positive explanation for this unusually high rate of leukemia has been found. And until an explanation is available, I believe that every possible clue should be explored. With this in mind, I visited the school and learned some interesting bits of information not previously uncovered. All but one of the leukemia cases were in two classrooms where the teachers followed the practice of keeping the curtains closed at all times because of the glare from the large areas of glass used in constructing the building. This then meant keeping the high intensity fluorescent lights on continuously, which at the time of the high leukemia incidents happened to be the deluxe warm white fluorescent tube, which is the pinkest of any of the standard tubes used for ordinary lighting purposes. In checking all the available records, I learned that this leukemia cluster, as this type of situation is commonly referred to, developed shortly after the teachers in these two rooms were transferred to this school and started to keep the curtains closed regardless of the weather and the fluorescent lights turned on all the time. I further learned that this situation had disappeared shortly after these same teachers were transferred on to other schools. And coincidentally, at this same time, all of the deluxe warm white tubes were old and were replaced with cool white, which though not a full spectrum type of tube, do represent less distortion than the deluxe warm white when compared to natural sunlight. Um, I've been looking at this and I'm realizing I'm really far behind. Um, this is going to go over a bit from an hour. Um, probably won't have a lot of time for discussion then, uh, if any. Um, I'll see if there's uh, something I can skip. But all right, terminal cancer. This is still John Ott telling a story. <clears throat> a Scandinavian doctor discovered that she had terminal cancer. She was a great nutritionist and thought fresh fish from the sea would be helpful because they contain all the minerals from the sea and would be freest of artificial preservatives and other additives. She gave up her practice and went to a small town in northern Norway where living was very simple and went out with the fishermen every day to help catch her fish. She too became a case of complete remission, but when she prescribed fresh fish in the diets of her patients back in the city, it didn't work. The reason it didn't work for her patients is because it wasn't the fish that cured her. It was the outdoors, sunlight, fresh air, exercise, healing negative ions from the moving waters of the ocean. All right, terminal cancer number two. I'm going a little faster. The cover story of Time Magazine about 10 or 15 years ago, this is a quote, by the way, from 1982, mentions such a complete remission. A man, upon being told he had terminal cancer, immediately stopped going to his office and started reading in a rocking chair on an open back porch and also working in his rose garden. The cancer disappeared and he became a medical, medically proven case of complete remission. Next category, Dr. Muhlenberg from the Netherlands. The next three accounts of hopeless cancer patients, yes, hopeless, are taken from the letter written by Dr. Hans C. Muhlenberg of the Netherlands to Dr. John Ott. They are recorded in the book, Light, Light Radiation and You. Brain tumor. Your letter set me thinking about the lives of my patients and something emerged which I did not expect. My very first patient was a boy with an astrocytoma, a brain tumor. My very first Laetrile patient, that is. Laetrile is a uh, controversial sort of um, drug. And they took a piece of the tumor localized in the sm small brains out and gave him some radiation. This boy, however, is nearly pure Laetrile patient as he was not holding to his diet very well and did not take his vitamins. He is now 18 and quite healthy. Now, this is a schoolboy who has to be on a bike four times a day and who is doing outdoor sports like rowing. All right, we're coming back to that. An inoperable ovarian cancer. My second Laetrile patient was a woman with a recurrence of an ovarian carcinoma, big as a fist. She was inoperable and got some endoxin, but she was in much pain and was looking very bad indeed. We are five years later now, and she is so good that the Cancer Institute is dying to open her up, but she refuses. 
Good for her. Now this woman is doing long stretches on her bike every day. She, she is an outdoor type and she lives in rather a rural country with wide open skies. Third story from him. Another patient is a man who lives in the same era. He came last year to my office dying from lung cancer. He was blue in the face and gasping for breath. And he had to be helped in by his wife and his brother. After a half year, he was in much better condition. And this is important to you, for you, this man, because this man is working outdoors in the small garden where he cultivates vegetables most of the day. Lately, however, the specialist became irritated that the man had not died yet and suddenly gave him huge doses of chemotherapy. And since then, he has deteriorated. Yeah, Dr. Muhlenberg is saying that about another doctor. The following is the conclusion of Dr. Muhlenberg's letter to Dr. Art Ott. He says, the last two patients were given diet, vitamins, minerals, and bromelain with laetrile. On the other hand, another patient with a big stomach tumor, who according to the hospital had two weeks to live, lived for 10 months, but he never went outdoors at all. And a colleague of mine has given laetrile to a lot of patients about a half year ago, and they all died. He lives in the northern part of the country where people often are strictly religious and cover themselves up in black clothes. All these things are no proof, are no proof, of course, but certainly it is a strange thing that the first three successful cases that came to my mind all were outdoor cases, so to speak, and that the unsuccessful cases, because I only mentioned one, but there are a lot more, hardly ever moved outdoors. And if they did so, it was by car, window glass. I will certainly look into this matter further. And if I find more material uh, that could be of importance to you, I will certainly write to you. As a matter of fact, I was quite honored to get a letter from Dr. John Ott himself. The three successful cases I wrote you about do not wear glasses. <laughs> okay. True North. This is very short. The True North Health Center is now the largest facility in the world that specializes in medically supervised water-only fasting. Participants, participants come to fast and detoxify, lose weight and make diet and lifestyle changes while enjoying a health-promoting diet derived from whole natural food. Now, there are numerous case studies and videos telling the amazing recovery stories of their water-only fast, fasters. They have had a number of patients dealing with lymphoma, lymphatic cancer. We are going to look at the published summarized story of just one of those patients, just a tiny little thing. This is the patient and her family before coming to True North. This is the patient after the 21 day water fast. The next slide is the published summarized facts. Here we present a three year follow-up report of a case that was originally published in BMJ case reports in December, 2015. Briefly, it's a 42-year-old woman presented to her primary physician with a palpable mass in her right inguinal region and was subsequently diagnosed with stage 3A grade 1 follicular lymphoma. In November 2014, the patient arrived at True North Health Center and elected to undergo a 21-day medically supervised water-only fast, after which she refed on an exclusively whole plant food diet free of added salt, oil, and sugar, including refined carbohydrates for 10 days. Over the course of treatment, her enlarged lymph nodes became impalpable. Follow-up CT scans confirmed reduction in size. She did not undergo standard cancer treatment, maintained the SO-free diet, and was symptom-free at three months and six months follow-ups. Yeah, Yvonne tells her story in detail on the True North website. Now, we contrast her exceedingly simple 21-day cancer regimes to Dr. Gerson's complicated, elaborate two-year cancer regime. She just stopped eating for three weeks. Simple, easy, effortless, automatic detox and healing. It fits God's natural law healthcare. Can it get any simpler than that? Wait till you see Eden Part 3B. It contains the most magnificent fasting stories you will ever hear. You will be a believer. And yes, there are numerous quotes from Ellen White recommending fasting. May Chung's cancer story. This is the last story. And then I conclude, uh, give a conclusion to it all. 
Maychung from 3ABN had a 100% cure rate when treating end-stage cancer patients. The following is just a tiny little paragraph summarizing that story. Here it is. May used no supplements, no concentrates, no juicing. She didn't even use man-made treatments. She simply followed the simple, basic lifestyle counsels we have been given. She had potential candidates promise that they would follow God's methods completely and forgive those who hurt them before she would agree to take them on. We need to do the same. Two different doctors would center these dying cancer patients. She followed the counsel that included a wide variety of simple foods, well-cooked grains, only two meals a day, walking in the sunlight and fresh air, etc. Actually, there's not a lot of etc. It was so simple. One patient came with throat cancer so bad that he could not even swallow. Mei Chung stayed up late to petition God to show her what to do. God told her, have him chew cabbage and spit. Chew cabbage and spit, chew cabbage and spit. Within a day, he could swallow again. All her patients were healed within a month at most with such simple lifestyle methods and intercessory prayer. Folks, multitudes are perishing within reach of abundant health, help. I am the Lord that healeth thee. For why should you die? Oh, yeah, we have an analysis. All right, here's all these different cancer regimes. The most common common denominators were whole plant-based food, an eat-in diet, or at least no meat or junk food, unfiltered sunlight and exercise. Those three main themes seem to be the dominant characteristics, the essence of treating cancer naturally, God's way, Eden's way. Sunglasses and eyeglasses, contact lenses are factors which need to be considered when treating cancer. Apparently, juicing is not required for treating cancer because none of them did it except that one. Uh, number four, fasting was the easiest and apparently one of the most effective treatments for cancer. Con uh, conclusion number five, Mei Chung's regime was the most balanced, the most effective because it was blessed by God. Number six, May asked God what to do and God answered. He showed her uh, what was within her reach. This regime, May's, May Chung's regime, was based on faith. The requirement to forgive removed, removed possible roadblocks to healing. The spiritual aspect was the most important thing that could be done for treating cancer. For it is always God who does the healing, no matter which of his healing agencies are used. God has given us many options for healing cancer. He heals us using whatever simple remedies he has placed within our reach, like he did with Mei Chung. It is clear, it is clearly not a requirement that all must be used, just whatever agencies he has placed within your reach. God does, does not have to use any of these natural remedies. That's just a quick list of the possible things that could be used to treat cancer. All right, conclusion. Dr. Gerson made natural cancer treatment very complicated, expensive, excessive, intemperate, labor-intensive, and exhausting. Yet the untitrated core of what he did has become accepted medical tradition in many alternative healthcare circles. What if treating cancer naturally is far simpler, easier, cheaper, and faster, safer than Gerson's medical traditions? What if it has always been that way? Just imagine caring for the sick in such a way that does not exist our, excuse me, that does not exhaust our budgets, our time, or our energy. Imagine that. The majority of those cancer recovery stories involve no man-made therapies, no hydrotherapy, no hyperbaric oxygen chambers, no colonics, no coffee enemas, 
no saunas, no light therapy, no light baths, no ultraviolet blood irradiation, no massage therapy, no essential oils, no charcoal, no poultices, no frequencies machines, no juicing, no supplements. That has got to mean something, folks. It was primarily related to diet, sunlight, and exercise. The best program added intercessory prayer and forgiveness. These are the types of things that God has specified. What if cancer remains difficult to treat even for new start practitioners simply because sunglasses and eyewear are overlooked, nature is not fully embraced, sin is not confessed, forgiveness is not offered, wisdom is not requested or waited for, trust is bestowed more on man's concentrates, supplements, therapies, medical theories, and traditions than in God and his specified healing agencies. We have within us an almost hardwired notion that we must treat patients under our care in order to earn our pay or reputation. Well, what if we were to calibrate that notion to be in harmony with Eden's automatic healing principles? What would that look like? All right, here's what it would look like. We would change the paradigm from the emphasis of treating patients to the emphasis of caring for patients as we let nature do most of the work of treating our patients. This paradigm shift would allow non-medical medical missionaries to care for patients without worry of lawsuits or being shut down by the, lay, by the medical mafias. Yeah, non-medical medical missionaries, that means laymen. All right, without worry of lawsuits or being shut down by the medical mafias, because legally, non-medical professionals treating the sick can be a risky business that can open a world of hurt on us, especially if the patient gets worse or dies. And I've heard of such horror stories. That's why we have to stay off the radar if we try it. The medical mafias can accuse us of practicing medicine without a license, especially if we charge for it, and these merchants of pharmacia have certainly shown their willingness to persecute us at minimum. Folks, we are sheep among wolves. Non-medical medical missionaries need not be dependent on treatments. If they feel that doing treatments on the sick would place themselves at an unacceptable risk, God has shown us an even better way. We simply care for the invalid and demonstrate the better way as we lead the invalid into the healing agencies of nature and a trust in God. We show them what God's nature can really do for them. We do what Mae Chung did for her patients, a proper diet, exercise, outdoors in the sunlight, forgiveness, and most importantly, intercessory prayer and faith. Nothing else. Now, there's nothing wrong with treatments. We are counseled to use them. But if I had to choose between all of my all of man's therapies combined or stepping out into God's automatic health care system, I would choose God's system in a heartbeat. And soon, we're not even going to have access to expensive equipment or concentrates. We must learn how to cure ourselves and the sick, Eden's way. And we must learn it and teach it and apply it now while we have opportunities. When we go door to door to care for the sick, as we've been told would happen in the end times, shall we rely solely on man's inferior indoor therapies? All that I'm suggesting here is a simple change of emphasis. The primary, primary interventions are to be what God specifies, nature, outdoors. Then we may supplement those with whatever simple nature, natural agencies and therapies God has placed within our reach. Yet even these simple therapies, which we typically use indoors, may be performed outdoors if weather permits. We are told to devise ways to get patients outdoors. This quote here is to become our new way to approach health and healing in these end times. This applies to both prevention and cure. Now, this is the last slide. If we would step back from long-held medical traditions of both pharmacia and natural healthcare, and re-examine from scratch healthcare as God intended, 
it will begin to dawn on us that God's healthcare system is freeing, it's liberating and empowering. It will also become plain that the simplicity of the gospel message is paired with the simplicity of the health message. Man is still trying to save himself spiritually by his own works, just as he is still trying to save himself physically by his own medical works. Yet both are an impossibility. But God offers both salvation and health free of charge. And he has made both easy and simple and free. He has already done the work for us. Yet both require compliance to the laws of God. And both require God's free grace to overcome the clamorings of our fallen nature. But we must ask him for that grace and surrender our wills to him. Righteousness by faith, health care by faith. We are called to be, to be restorers of the breach in God's law. That includes both the moral laws and the health laws. The gospel message cannot be separated from the health message. The health message is truly the right arm of the gospel. And if we are to understand the laws that make up that right arm of the gospel, then we must go back to the very beginning, back to the very gates of Eden, and study for ourselves God's magnificent outdoor automatic health care system. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this magnificent outdoor automatic health care system. It's going to change all of our lives, and we thank you for bringing it up to people around the world on this. I am convinced this is where you're taking us. So we ask for your blessings as we try to carry this out and work it out and learn it and teach it and demonstrate it, sir. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, that is the end of that. Let me close that down.